Welcome back to our debate about the future of Europe, about the current uh, topics, about uh, reforming European Union, EU 37, Pax Europeana, I call it. But this video now very much focused on how to resolve the debt crisis in which we are now as a result of uh, the Corona crisis. Corona crisis, very serious crisis, public health crisis, and really much uh, bigger crisis than I have estimated in March or in January. And um, yes, uh, we have a real big crisis now. The question is now how to really respond economically and how to grow out of uh, this crisis in the next level to have uh, serious growth and uh, uh, how also how to really reduce the existing debts, uh, debts uh, which we accumulate. Yeah? So first of all, it's very serious crisis. But, you know, the question is really, should we go into this hyperbole, you know, about the biggest crisis ever, I hear, the biggest crisis since World War II, the biggest crisis since, you know, the world economic crisis in 29. I hear a lot of exaggerations. Please, we should be historically correct, yeah? even when the second quarter of uh, 2020 will be one of the worst in history, maybe. Yeah? It's not the worst crisis we ever faced. Yeah? First of all, you know, we have enormous amount of assets and reserves accumulated in the last 70 years of peace in Western Europe. Yeah? So ultimately, you can, the crisis may be a continuation of many crises in Ukraine and in the European periphery, much harder hit by this crisis again, and much less reserves. But in rich Western Europe, to talk about such a crisis is then somehow negrigating the really very terrible post-war reconstruction crises. We still had hunger in '47, the Korea War and the escalation of the Cold War in the 50s, in the 60s, the Cuba crisis, you know, the oil shock of the 70s, and especially the terrible 70s, a really a, a, a decade where the West was basically in retreat, yeah, with Iran lost, Afghanistan lost, Vietnam War, all these crises, and then to talk that we are in the biggest crisis ever, that's a little bit, you know, you know, it's exaggerated, it's out of proportion, yeah? but it's a serious crisis, we have to address it, we have to find the right answers for this one, you know, we have managed, I want to reiterate the global financial crisis of 2008, you know, the migration crisis of 2015 and the Ukraine crisis of 2014 and also 9-11 and all the consequent wars, yeah, it was really that uh, permanent, some major things happening and we have the institutions to address them. Luckily, we have this institutional capacity and institutional uh, flexibility to address it, even when we are always surprised by what there is coming. You know, you cannot be prepared on everything all the time, but in ultimately, we have uh, this capacity. And now, how to exactly address it? First, you know, to understand exactly the four intertwined crises, what are happening. The public health crisis, the liquidity crisis resulting out of uh, two months or three months of uh, no demand, and the growth crisis and the debt crisis. So I repeat, public health crisis, the liquidity crisis, the growth crisis and the debt, the debt crisis. And you know, when you understand that it's four crises which are connected with each other, you have to address every single one separately. The public health crisis, you know, lockdown, that's happened now, time to reduce it and go to social distance. Medication, there is already a number of various uh, medication levels. And vaccination, we are on a good track. Now it's time really to approve this uh, already existing vaccinations and then to roll them out. But I'm confident there will be already very soon in the end of the year. They will rightly for a possible second phase of Corona. There will be already a vaccination ready for a lot of uh, the segments of the population. 2021 even better. So the public health crisis, despite it being really terrible, we have uh, addressed already and we will address. And, you know, let's have confidence as well and trust in modern science, in our institutions, and they will deliver and they are delivering already. The liquidity crisis, you know, there is already so, you know, that's a really significant. When you don't have income for two months for individual, for a business, you don't have demand 
And you know, we have uh, in the corporate sector, in the small and medium enterprises, and for the consumers. Outside of the public sector, it's a real, real, really tough situation for many people. And this has to be addressed. And here, the state has to be generous. And it must be basically, as much as possible, um, somehow softened the blows by the public sector. In the corporate sector, it must be, you know, by state interventions, basically loaning or entering into the equity of the companies for a period, not for permanent nationalization, but, you know, uh, providing equity, providing loans, uh, bridge fi funding for this uh, really big shock in the SME sector, direct support. And also consumers must be supported, not only in the social system, but direct assistance is the best way to bridge this terrible second quarter 2020. Then again, it's a growth crisis, you know, how to really get everything organized from July 2020, you know, how to really lift all, I mean, that's obvious, we have to lift all of these restrictions in whatever, you know, maybe have, keep masks and, you know, make some carefulness and, uh, but it must be really um, openness from July 2020. Already the borders in Europe opened on the 14th of June 2020. I made that case already in the video about, about Schengen. That's 35 years of Schengen. And that's very important to really lift all this. But how to really have growth again? So it's very, very important to lower taxes. Because the reflex of a lot of etatists in all parties, everybody from the left to the right, from the center, will be to increase taxes to fix first the state finances via higher taxes. But that would, and then of all these famous justice arguments, you know, increase, kill the wealthy, you know, take it all from Gates, and so all this nonsense. Yeah? But that's very wrong. We have to be uh, lowering taxes to have growth of the SME sector and really make sure that innovation pays off and that we really have entrepreneurship and innovation, risk-taking. A lot of people will be very careful to take risks then when they have seen this and experienced this terrible shock out of the nowhere. So ultimately, really lower taxes is the way forward from 2020 onwards. Yeah? Reduce income tax, reduce corporate tax, and keep consumption tax stable at 20%. Yeah? No lowering of VAT and crazy ideas. Yeah? This is, of course, a very important pillar for uh, the state budget. But in the corporate tax, in the income tax, in uh, decrease and cut the taxes, uh, no higher rates, no increases of already so high taxes in Europe. That's totally wrong. But I hope there will be reasonable uh, ways. Um, and so that's very much uh, to for the growth crisis, but that's one pillar of the growth crisis, lower taxes. The second one is obviously to open our trading system, ratify the EU-Mercosur agreement and make sure that ASEAN-EU agreement goes finally into a settlement and the Indonesian agreement. Yeah? That's very important that we help these 11 countries to open, uh, to join the WTO and conclude these 11 very important uh, FTAs, free trade agreements. So we must be, have openness yeah? to have the really after such a crisis, it's a choice between protectionist decline, you know, I save you, I'm the politician, I close the borders, I protect you from the market. Yeah? That's what the dangerous people will shout. Yeah? And, you know, protect us from the protectionists is ever more true at this moment. Yeah? What Trump has done damage to this debate is really unforgivable. Yeah? But also Kurz and, you know, also Vadaka from Ireland and the Slovakian left. Yeah? Really, it's very dangerous. Yeah? So we need openness. Yeah? And the future is not to buy the local produce. Everybody is free to buy local produce if he wants. Yeah? But to allow market access uh, to all our partners and friends with which we have friendly agreements like EU Mercosur. And the EU Commission is only doing friendly agreements, please, yeah, let's ratify Mercosur, let's get the uh, FDA with all Na NATO allies done, we have already with Canada, now it's time for US-EU agreement, and obviously WTO enlargement, I am said already, and EU enlargement, obviously, that's very important, yeah, get the three countries, Albania, Macedonia, Montenegro in the European Union, 
but also open the way for our partners in the customs union fast in 2024, Ukraine and the and um, um, Kosovo and uh, Serbia and Bosnia in the customs union and Moldova and Georgia and uh, really offer that also to Uzbekistan to have an FDA or possible join the EU customs union and also to Azerbaijan. And then very big infrastructure project. Now you will ask me, you know, when we have already a lot of debt from Corona, how to really make big infrastructure? But, you know, after we have now bridged the demand for a quarter, it's now important to really have lasting project with a long-term financing line, which the EIB and the EBRD are there to finance, and then to build really very important, focused on Eastern European connectivity, infrastructure to Ukraine and to the Southern Caucasus, to Turkey, and especially also to make the two big projects, uh, the Messina Bridge uh, to Tunisia and also the Gibraltar Bridge from Spain uh, to Morocco, and really somehow um, end this um, locked-in situation of the European continent by building very big infrastructure lines uh, towards Africa and Asia, and inside the periphery of Europe, whatever needs to be done from the Messina Bridge to Sicily or all the connectivity in the Balkans, the Adriatic Highway, the connectivity with railways and highways towards uh, uh, Ukraine, including. These are really very important projects. Now we need a big plan on the infrastructure side, railway, highway energy and have it, you know, for the next 30 years, 2050 as the target where all these things are done. Maybe something will need 2060, you know, but let's fund it, let's finance it, let's build it and let's start now. You know, let's start now. And not the fifth Alpine tunnel, we have already a lot, yeah. But really what is the productivity of a European continental union? Ukraine, Turkey, and the Southern Caucasus, the link to Asia, bypassing Russia, bypassing Iran, via the Caspian, making sure Africa is physically connected much better with European Union, and build it and do it. That's the way out of the growth crisis, I repeat. Lower taxes, or more open trade system, and massive infrastructure investment. Now you will ask me, how shall we then handle the debt? Because we have already a lot of debt in Europe. Uh, Italy has much too much. Yeah? Greece has unsustainable levels. Yeah? So here the answer comes. We have 16 trillion of state assets in the member states, mostly very badly managed. Yeah? These are the source of corruption in Italy and Greece and all these uh, southern European states, but also in Austria. We have, uh, whatever, 25 billion of state assets from the um, highways, from the railways, from the energy sector, from casinos yeah, we own in Austria, or massive land, yeah, for historic reasons. All this has to be questions, the things which can be easily sold for a good price up to the stock exchange in the Western European countries, where there are working stock exchange. IPO, let's go. The things which can only difficultly be sold for a good price, yeah, let's not sell it to the Chinese, our ports or our railways. Yeah? Let's bring it to the European level. I have said already many times, let's make swaps uh, between debt, equity, and uh, between the member states levels, incompetent level, to the European level, competent level. That means Austrian railway transferred to the European Investment Bank and debt reduced for the Austrian state. Austrian state can do welfare and maybe some defense and what it really should do as a state. And the EIB can merge the Austrian state as a railway then with other railway systems, with Deutsche Bahn and with SNCF. I hope they will also join in this system and with the Italian railway and make one European railway infrastructure company. And by the way, the operation should be already liberalized and hopefully they will then uh, privatize the operations. Yeah? But the state should run the railway system on the European level and then build all this fantastic infrastructure which we really need, which the Asians have already, and we are lagging behind because we are not unified enough. That has to change now after Corona. So privatize what can be reasonable well privatized on the stock exchange. That's really very simple. Just make an IPO. And what cannot be reasonable well sold, or for strategic re reasons, uh, shouldn't be sold. Yeah? 
like uh, some of the defense maybe, and not to sell it to the Chinese or Russians, please, yeah, and not to the communists and not to Putin, yeah. But what can be sold, um, reasonable sell, what can be not sold or shouldn't be sold, then transfer to the European Investment Bank and reduce the debts of the member states and somehow unify Europe by the state assets. You know, the famous idea is, you know, that Europe has now its Alexander Hamilton moment. You know, Alexander Hamilton was the Minister of Finance of the US after the, civil, after the independence war, who unified and really developed America as a nation state or as a state union, what it is more correct to say. It is uh, basically he unified the 13 member state steps and created a federal treasury, federal bank. That was very good. You know, in a way, yes, we should do that, yeah? but not without asset backed, uh, backing. That means not just to unify um, everything from the debt, yeah? and you know, because so many of the people who want to unify debt, they don't want to unify the taxation. Obviously, you know, when you unify debt, you need to unify taxation as well. So at best, I really don't propose that, and nobody else proposes that, uh, I think so, at that moment, to have a European income tax, European corporate tax, and basically finish that level of um, uh, taxation on the in member state level, because that would be part of the game if you really fully uh, Europeanize the debt. Yeah? No, I don't say that, and I think it's too early, maybe never a very good idea, because really, do we need such a powerful European level like uh, in America? I don't think so, because of the historic history uh, differences and also because, you know, of legitimacy issues and many other issues. But what I say, you know, to unify the state companies makes a lot of sense in this fragmented uh, many uh, countries of Europe. You know, why to have uh, a motorway system just, you know, for Austria, a motorway system just for Czech Republic. We can do a European motorway system. We can do a European energy system and the backbones mainly. The generation can be privatized, but, you know, and competing with each other. But the infrastructure, why not to have one transmission operator system in Europe owned by the EIB and the member states have, if they want, some share in that or they sell it to the EIB and the EIB owns it. And the EIB can go then to float it partly on the European stock exchange in Frankfurt or London or in New York. I mean, it's so logical here. And on the railway system, you know, we don't need... Um, 25 or 27 or 40 European railway infrastructure holdings, each by incompetent, corrupt state politicians who just want to set their children into the boards of their companies or their political friends and have great salaries. I mean, that's not really very efficient, and actually that's very expensive, and it doesn't produce a great result, yeah? I mean, in China they have now, in communist China they have a better fast track uh, rail, uh, rail system than we, because we're simply not unified enough. So it's really important uh, not to unify debt alone, but unify the state assets and the debt attached to them. That means the Austrian state, for example, or Italian state, or the best example is the, the Greek uh, privatization fund, which is now producing more or less some results, you know, always exciting us for selling something to China or to Russia, and which then anyhow doesn't materialize. But the reasonable thing is transfer the whole asset to Frankfurt, give the ownership to the EIP, make an evaluation how much it costs, reduce the debts of the Greek state accordingly. So Greece is again a normal EU member state, not with some magic irrealistic figures you know, of debt to GDP, which they never can repay, but it has a normal situation, but doesn't own the assets, and the assets are still in state hand, but owned by everybody. Managed well, gradually sold off or restructured into a European railway system, into a European energy company, into a European motorway company and not in the hands of communist China or oligarchs from Russia. I think that's the much better way to do that. And so uh, Alexander Hamilton moment, but uh, adopted one. Yes, 
I am for more unification of our economic system, very much so, even when it's not in the private sector, but in the public sector. But it's much better to take it out of the incompetence of member states into the more competent and more rational, responsible management of the European investment banks. And yes, relieve, and maybe to be generous, uh, to relieve uh, the southern Europeans mainly, but also the eastern Europeans, but also more incompetent, smaller countries like Austria, incompetent in the sense of uh, managing the state assets. Yeah? Relieve them of these assets. You know, we are all semi-socialist kind of countries and every politician loves to have this asset. You know, why? Because you know, it's a lot of patronage. The Americans call it pork um, barrel or whatever. You know, it's basically corruption means, you know, you are the party leader, young or old, doesn't matter, but you own uh, the energy sector, the railway sector, the highway sector, the casino sector, the water sector, a lot of land. And what you do, basically, you um, decide who is sitting there. And they all have very good contracts, you know, in the several hundred thousands a year in the salary. And also they control, you know, who is the advertising budget, who is, you know, doing what. And, you know, you control a significant part of the society and uh, of the economy and with it the society. Because it's also about jobs then, you know. You need a secretary job somewhere. You need a political assistance. You need to get your young politicians uh, somehow trained in the private sector. Now put them on the, as a executive assistant to a board member from your party. And so it works, you know. That's all kind of political patronage. It's all sleazy corruption. It's all very expensive and it's not very productive, yeah. Then, of course, it's argued, you know, we have to give the core of ownership. Otherwise, you know, the Germans will own us. What's so bad to have some German efficiency and German capital or American capital? Ultimately, our own incompetence is always leading then, you know, to some Chinese or Russian owners. And that, we think, is strategically balancing. Yeah? Okay. I mean, you, we can continue like this. As long as we are rich, we can do a lot of nonsense. Yeah? But it's not really good. So unifying that, putting it to Strasbourg or Luxembourg, having a rational European railway system allowing us to really build the technology level, best standards, interconnectivity, not just in France, TGVs, or in Germany, ECS, but you know, to build it from Brussels to Istanbul and from Kiev to whatever Biarritz, yeah, whatever is needed, whatever makes sense, east, west, north, west, yeah, and north, west, south, and really do very good infrastructure planning and do it much faster. Even in Africa, they're discussing about the uh, um, high-speed railway interconnectivity railway system by 2063. They want to be ready. Where's our big plan to be ready? And this is now the moment. Get this ready and really grow ourselves out of this crisis by better institutions. Not that they are bad, yeah? but we have a lot of inherited traditional things in Europe which need a little bit to be questions. Why to exactly do everything like we did it in the 1960s? <laughs> You know, why to keep such a big uh, state sector for, when, from a time when this was inherited, you know, from the German Reich in the Austrian situation, or, uh, because to save it from the Soviets, that is the history of the Austrian state sector. And then we kept on this 